this week we are working on part two of the druid costume make. We will be working through the druid dresses as well as a few little added accessories like a little bag to hang off a belt. I was actually stuck at my parents' house during the initial making of the base dresses, which meant I had no access to my stash for those. It took about two weeks to make all the decisions and designs and put the whole dress together. So there's a lot of content, let's just jump on in. This outfit will be made up of two dresses. I bought a light green linen look viscous for the underdress and a plain weave dark green cotton linen for the overdress. Starting with the viscous, I followed the cutting instructions for piece 10 of McCall's 7988 to make a simple gathered underdress. You could also make one big rectangle rather than cutting it up, but I didn't think of that until after I cut everything. For the sleeves, I elongated piece 7 of McCall's 8108, so they would be longer versions of option A, but with a second gathered puff added. For some reason I got it in my head that I needed four of these, but you actually only need two. I stitched together the three panels for the base dress along the side seams. And then pressed them open. I created a draw cord channel at the top of the dress by folding over the top edge once. I used some thick elastic my mother had in her stash to run through the channel at the top of the dress. My fabric was actually too heavy for this to be successful. It just kept falling down, so I pulled it out and used some twill tape to tie it in place instead of the elastic. I used a similar construction method for the sleeves, sewing the underarm seam together and then folding the top edge over twice to create a channel at the top. I cut a length of elastic for the sleeve's top elastic channel and threaded it into place. I use a zigzag stitch to secure my elastic together and usually go back and forth over the overlap three times. Then carefully close up the insertion point. To create two puffs, I folded the sleeve in half and made another elastic channel in the middle of the sleeve. Now at this point, I wasn't actually sure what I wanted to do with the hem of the sleeves, so I set the underdress aside and began on the overdress. I traced off the lower bodice pieces from Vogue 2960 and set about making alterations.
I started by closing the darts on the bodice front. I measured halfway between the dart lines and drew a line from that mark through the dart point to the other edge of the pattern piece. I then made new dart lines from the outer corners of the original dart to the top of the line on the other side of the pattern. I filled in the inside of the dart just to indicate that this will be the area I'm getting rid of. I cut out my pattern piece except for the bottom edge. Cut along one of the new dart lines, leaving it attached just at the very point. Close your dart by moving your pattern piece over the crossed out section, matching up your dart lines, and tape it closed. The bottom edge can now be safely cut. I also took one centimeter off the center front to give some room for the laces. I followed the same method to close the back darts and took the seam allowance off the center back, changing it to be cut on the fold. Finally, I went in and proved the underarm curve to give it a nice shape. For the skirt, I used the same piece 10 from McCall 7988, this time making it one continuous piece. I only had enough fabric to do two folded repeats instead of three, so I just stripped off the last half repeat and used that for the bodice pieces. I cut out the altered bodice pieces in the main fabric as well as some white cotton drill to use as interfacing. I basted the lining layer and interlining layer together, and then stitched them together at the side seams. I then marked where I wanted my boning channels to go, marking them on one half of the bodice, and then copying to the other, and stitched them into place. After sewing the main side seams, I stitched the lining to the main layer along the top and sides, leaving the bottom open. I trimmed back the corners and front edge seam allowances and clipped the top curve before flipping right side out and pressing. I measured and cut boning for each of the channels. I worked out you can flatten your boning by using an iron and some books. First heat up the plastic boning, making it malleable, and then let them cool with the books on top to flatten them. This only works if your fabric can act as a pressing cloth so you don't melt the boning. 
I folded my skirt pieces in half and curved the front hem by eye. Then I ran two rows of gathering stitches along the top edge. I recommend changing your top thread to a contrasting color to the bobbin thread so you can more easily separate the bobbin threads when pulling the gathers. The skirt was attached to just the main fabric of the bodice. The lining gets folded under and hand stitched into place over the top. But first, the boning for the center front edges was pinned into place. These will be held in place with the eyelets instead of adding any top stitching. Speaking of eyelets, I used pins to mark where each eyelet would go. I decided to hand stitch them for a more organic feel. This nail embedder was the closest thing my dad had to an awl in his workshop. I still don't have anything that's actually meant to be used for this. My lacing cord kept fraying, so I used a little bit of thread to just reinforce the ends. Back at home, I sketched up a quick embroidery design to add some much needed pattern to the outer dress and transferred it on with pencil. I used stem, satin, and backstitch to create the vines and acorns and used the lazy daisy stitch for the leaves. Despite it being a large piece to embroider, it actually only took about a day of sewing to add all of the motifs. At this point, I had finally decided to finish the sleeve hem with another elasticated edge, creating the second puff. To make it easier to walk, I also created a slight rise in the hem of the underdress. It was still feeling too polished, so I created bunches in the skirts and set about dip dyeing the hems of the dresses with brown dye. To help them fade into the rest of the fabric, I wet the fabric first and then let them dry upside down. This helped to soften the dye's top edge so it wouldn't be a sharp change to brown. Once dry, I popped everything onto my mannequin and pinned where I wanted some fabric leaf cutouts to go. These were then hand stitched into place.
The overdress still needed just a little bit more, so I hand stitched some of the cording around the waist and the top edge. I of course had to add a little belt pouch for my Druid Adventurer. I used the two dress fabrics for the main and lining of the bag, some felt for the batting, and some scraps of suede from a sample sleeve for the flap and belt loop. After everything was cut out, I started by quilting the base of the lining to the felt padding, marking out my stitch lines, and then sewing from the innermost lines outwards. I love using friction erasable pens because all your marks disappear with a simple press of the iron. I stitched the back seam of the lining, leaving about an inch open at the top end, and then also stitched the full back seam of the main bag. The lining base was pinned right sides together with the lining walls and stitched. The same was done to the main bag base and walls. With right sides together and matching up the back seam, the lining and main bag were attached at the top edge. I then trimmed back the excess lining that I forgot to account for in my original patterning and used the little hole left in the lining back seam to flip the whole bag right side out. A draw cord channel is sewn along the top edge and a draw cord threaded through, again using that back seam gap. Finally, fold the belt loop in half and line it up with the base of the leaf flap. Securely stitch to just under the draw cord channel, centering the leaf with the back seam. This was probably the most hand sewing I've ever put into any garment I have made. I am so proud of how this came together though. So starting with the underdress, I think it's functional, but it's lacking that extra bit of magic. I love the drape of the fabric, but it's a little too heavy as seen when I tried to hold it up with elastic initially and it just was not happening. I thought about adding some extra bits to the sleeves, but I had to film the reveal at the location before the staff video came out, which meant I just ran out of time and the character I constructed in my head is just starting out. So it kind of made sense that her outfit was a little bit plain and it will just get more elaborate the more adventures that she goes on and the sort of higher level she would get. 
Not that I'm playing her in any campaign, but you know, it, it helps sell the story in my head. The overdress is where I did go to town on embellishments, at least for me and my usual sewing habits. I would love to do a little bit more embroidery on the bodice, but I kind of only have so much patience for it and I was worried it was gonna put too many different colors or too much of one color in and so I just held back a little bit. I think the addition of the piping really helped pull all of the components together and gave it a little bit of definition that I was loving with the very, very base outfit. It gave these really beautiful clean lines. The piping brought that definition back without looking too clean. Finally, the little belt pouch. This is actually a revamped version of a belt pouch that I made for my first and only ever LARP session. I added the little oak leaf flap to coordinate with the rest of the outfit and to blend it in with the little leaf peplum. I think this would make a great dice bag. Just, just saying. You can actually find the free pattern download over on my new Patreon. Before you jump forward or click away, I've spent a lot of time thinking about ways to share everything in one place paid patterns, free patterns, sewing patterns and knitting patterns and templates, while also building up more of a community to further share and grow with like-minded people. I chose Patreon because I can post publicly to share all of the free patterns while also being able to offer the paid patterns via the tiers. The tiers are also where I will share behind the scenes information on upcoming projects, as well as extra tutorials, run make-alongs for the various patterns available for that tier, and you'll be able to give input on what videos you want to see next. And if you want to become a mage of mending, you can even get a little gift twice a year. This will be an environment where we can create, share, and grow together. So. If you would like to make this little bag, head over to the Patreon via the link in the description. You can download the free pattern and I will see you back here next week. I hope you have a lovely week. Bye.